<laughs> you would be both. Okay, right? We're gonna go for five seconds of silence, and then Bruce and I are gonna go in. Welcome. You're listening to Sports Econ 101, the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Today's show is going to be really fun because we've got Rich Walkoff, who's a sports director at KGO Radio in San Francisco. He'll join us in the uh, upcoming segment here. Uh, Bruce, what are we going to talk about? Oh, we're going to talk about the retirement, uh, the sudden and surprising retirement of 24-year-old uh, linebacker Chris Borland, who decided to walk away from the game because he is very concerned about the after effects of any kind of head trauma. He doesn't want to, to end up, uh, you know, being a walking vegetable. And what round was he going to go in? Well, he was picked by the 49ers. He was, he was their top rookie last year. He uh, had, I think, a little, Rich will tell you more about it, but he, he had a terrific year. And it's just, it's kind of a shock. You know, when you hear about a young player, 24 years old, walking away from the game, doesn't Yeah, I wonder how many millions he's walking away yeah. from. All right, so now at each commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question. And the first uh, three emails with the correct answer are going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort, which is located about an hour northeast of San Francisco. And the vacations are free. Their only request is a $75 cleaning fee to cover those housekeeping expenses. Uh, their website, if you want to check them out, is lighthouseresortandmarina.com. You can listen to Sports Econ 101 on iHeartRadio live. Tune in radio, Sports Byline USA, CRN, and a lot of other uh, uh, stations around the country. And today's trivia theme is baseball players and presidents. Mm, we got a little, little, yeah. little different on that. Yeah. And this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding over 8% secured by real estate. Doesn't get any more conservative than that. Check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. Uh, you're listening to Sports Econ 101 with Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan. When we come back in the next segment, we're going to introduce Rich Walkoff who's the sports director of KGO Radio in San Francisco, and he's been there, oh, just a few years, right, Bruce? Yeah, about 30 years altogether. About 30 years. Okay, yeah. so that'll be kind of fun to have him on the show. All right, stay tuned. You're listening to Sports Econ 101, and we will be right back. All right, that's our first Bruce, little segment. Yeah. Bruce, that was a great reference to a walking vegetable. That, that was really... Uh, you like that? I'm trying to visualize the walking vegetable. <laughs> Is he what, about 5'11"? Yeah, I, I talked to him. I, I could share some thoughts. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a shame. I, I, well, I mean, it's great for him that he's doing this now rather than getting into trouble, but uh, it's, it's a shame for the 49ers. What's he going to do? He lost. He's going back to school, get his uh, graduate degree in sports management. I think he wants to be an agent, doesn't he, Rich? I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Sports management. I mean, you can... Don't ask me questions you don't already know the answer. That's yeah. <laughs> I think, I think Bruce also wants to talk about the NFL draft and all yeah, that kind of stuff. We, we just have a lot of fun here. So, Okay, you guys ready? Fun is our middle name. That's right. Oh, fun? Okay, here we go. Well, welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Bruce, why don't you introduce our guest? Yeah, it's a pleasure to bring in our uh, good friend, Rich Walkoff. I've known Rich for... Over three decades, he's been the sports director for KGO, and Rich is covering the 49ers very closely. The uh, station that he's been working for over the years has carried the 49ers. Rich was the sideline reporter, now presently uh, co-hosts the pre- and post-game shows. And i got to ask you, Rich, about uh, Chris Borland retiring. It kind of shook us all up uh, when we heard the news because this was a young man whose career was just really starting to flourish. He had a, a great rookie year last year, had 22 tackles in his second start, led the team in tackles. I mean, what's going on with this guy? Why the uh, sudden dis decision to make a, a rash move like this? Well, you know, it, it seems impulsive and rash, but when we hear all the evidence of the dangers of head trauma, and what was that recent Boston University study revealing that of the 79 brains of uh, former NFL players that they have examined, 76 had evidence of CTE, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, of course, it's triggered by head trauma, and it's a degenerative disease that uh, deteriorates the brain to the point that many become suicidal, depressed, and, and often, uh, you know, their lives are destroyed. So, Chris Borland suffered a concussion early in training camp or preseason last year. He was concerned about a future health risk, even though I think only 24 years of age. Cut short 
a very promising NFL career a week after the man he filled in for and replaced Patrick Willis retired. Not as prematurely, obviously, at the age of 30, but uh, both were surprising in the sense that they were, you know, star players, one in the making, and one one of the best in the game and a potential Hall of Famer. So, uh, double whammy for the four ers at the inside linebacker position. I think we may see more of this. Young guys who either suffer concussions or become more concerned about how their futures in the game you know, reconcile that with their futures away from football. Maybe they'll all try to uh, do for another position, you know, be a punter or something, you know. <laughs> place kicker. Yeah, place, place kicker. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's safer, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not something you can transition. How many inside linebackers are kicking field goals nowadays? <laughs> yeah. Well, and uh, linebacking uh, is a naturally a very dangerous position because you're right in the middle of all the action. You remember Junior Seau suffered a number of uh, yeah. head trauma blows, and, and he finally uh, suffered from the CTE and was really in misery. Uh, it's interesting, though. You talk to a lot of young players, Rich, and they are willing to roll the dice and say, look, you know, I may have problems down the road, but I love playing football. I guess Chris Borland is just cut from a diff different cloth here. Yeah, you know, that for you, Bruce, uh, I went around the locker room uh, with the 49ers early last year following more revelations of the dangers of head trauma and uh, multiple concussions and the likelihood of contracting CTE. And, of course, right now it is uh, not treatable, not even diagnosable until posthumously. And most players, if not all, said inherent risks. They know what's going in. Uh, I'm not a concern. Of course, these are young, strapping, 20-something year old uh, guys. They're invincible. Yeah, right? they can't exactly have a big picture view, or very few do. But I think as more and more evidence comes to the forefront, and unfortunately, it's not very encouraging on the on the safety factors for the game, that you might find more guys either deciding not to pursue football, he's popular yeah. in high school football, uh, enrollments are down, and maybe guys with uh, you know more of those health concerns will be uh, more reluctant to pursue the career or certainly more cautious about continuing the career if they have some health issues. I'll tell you a little adjunct to this. Dr. Harry Edwards was talking to me last year, a long time advisor of the Fort Niners and a uh, very astute observer of the sport. And, best known perhaps for his involvement in the 1968 protest the Olympics, uh, the, the, you know, Carlos Smith, Black Power, Tommy Smith, and, and such, those, those guys on the podium in Mexico City. He said he thinks that the NFL in the coming years will become 90% African American. And his thinking was more socioeconomic than anything because a lot of the more affluent white middle class and beyond mothers will not want their sons to play football uh, as they have other options. Whereas if you come out of a poorer neighborhood, you're a ghetto kid, you know, maybe that's your lottery ticket. Maybe if you're a gifted athletic league, that is your best means of achieving something special. And uh, African-American parents may be more inclined to allow their sons to play football uh, as, as a means out, if you will, for not only them, but maybe all of those in the family and kind of carry kind of it along. So that, that was a fascinating socioeconomic, socioeconomic overview or, or, you know, prospect of what could be coming mm. to the NFL in the next decade or so. Well, yeah, that's interesting, too, because, you know, you play linebacker, you're theoretically the guy who gives the hits, not receives them, but, you know, with all that stuff going on in the middle, there's always going to be the Hard well, you know, it's not just the helmet to helmet hit, which, you know, the NFL is becoming very um, over, I mean, just hyper aware of it and uh, trying to almost ban the, uh, you know, launching and, and defenseless receivers and the like. But it's all the contact, even if it's shoulder pad to shoulder pad, what we're now learning and, and knowing is that the brain moves abruptly into the skull on contact shoulder to shoulder, that, that trauma in and of itself can be damaging and eventually could trigger CTE. Well, but just also just being tackled where your head hits the ground. Well, yeah, all of the above. So it's, it's, it's when bodies slam together, etc., 
doesn't necessarily mean the helmet has to hit another helmet or hit another part of the ground or the body. It's just the impact of actually the collision. If the body is the ground or another player, it's collisions that are causing head traumas. And we all know it's intrinsic and endemic to the game. So as long as it's football as we know it, it may not be football as we love it, for many of the guys gifted to play it. Yeah, they may end up uh, giving them uniforms that are like those uh, sumo wrestler uh, uh, party <laughs> things, you know, the inflatable things that people wear. Uh, well, you know, i got to ask you, Rich, the NFL, it really has to be shaking in its boots over this, uh, yeah. these, these revelations. You know, guys leaving the game now, players, it's been proven that the repeated head trauma has had detrimental effect and, and disastrous effect on people's health. And the league is no longer in a position where it can deny that this doesn't exist. I mean, we always knew that it was a dangerous sport. Your knees, your shoulders, your back, your, you know, your hips were always uh, subject to, to injury. Now we're finding out that the worst injuries are to the brain. And what is the NFL going to do about this? Because there's really no way, as you point out, to protect the brain. You can build a, a, a helmet that maybe is a little more effective, but I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference because, as you, as you were mentioning, the brain is moving quickly yeah. within the casing of the, of the skull, and that's where the trauma comes in. Yeah, that's it. And, and again, it's almost uh, unavoidable and, and not something that can be corrected. So you have this inherent intrinsic risk, sort of the way boxers know that you can be knocked out or suffering early dementia, yet many still pursue the sport. So will, be, will players be signing disclaimers, potentially saying, I know the risk is going in, and, and I am taking responsibility, given what we know about the nature of the game? I think we're going to come almost to that point. Yeah, but you know what? I don't know how much that's still going to do any good. You know, no, it's not talking about doing any good. But you just protect the NFL from further repercussions, because we, look, we all know that they were very adamant in uh, their uh, defense and denials about relationships between repeated head trauma and any yeah. possible problems that ensue in the, in the coming years. Well, now they've acknowledged belatedly and begrudgingly the connection between repeat head trauma and, uh, and sure. the right. Well, you know, how these, you know how attorneys can get a hold of this stuff. Um, so, uh, and Rich, stay with us. Uh, we're just going to cut to a quick commercial break here. The studio needs me to cut to one here. Uh, here's our first trivia question. Again, the theme is uh, baseball players and presidents. Sharing the name of a U.S. president, this catcher played for the Cardinals, Padres, Orioles, and Giants. He retired in 1991 after making two World Series appearances. Who is he? All right, don't say, anything, don't, say anything, don't say anything yet. <laughs> don't say anything. We'll let you answer when we come back. You'll see in Sports Econ 101. Got to be okay, Terry, yeah. Terry Kennedy, right? Terry Kennedy, yes. Good guy. Good guy. Okay. I always have to throw kind of an easy one in there once in a while. You know, his Actually, dad was the first manager of the Oakland A's. John Kennedy. Or not John Kennedy. Uh, Bob Kennedy. When they came to Oakland. When they came to Oakland. Yeah, he, was the, uh, he was their first manager. And then Charlie fired him and brought in Hank Bauer, fired him, and brought in Dick Williams. Oh, yeah. Good, people, right? Good old Charlie Finley. How about those Warriors last night? God, that was yeah, a, that was, that was a, a game. tough game. They barely won that game. I, I've been out of the loop for almost the whole week. I just kind of tuned out. They, uh, well, they, can't, they, they didn't lose a game while you were gone. But you know, bad news is uh, Clay Thompson's out for uh, about uh, oh, two weeks to two three weeks with a sprained ankle. Was so, it out that long? Uh, Clay Thompson. He'll miss about three weeks. Really? Yeah, sprained in the ankle. And it's weird because he ne we never saw it during the game last night. But apparently, it was one of those delayed. Kind of injuries. It's probably for the best. He won't play a whole lot down the stretch, and they'll have him healthy for the postseason. So, well, why would they get that number one seed? Yeah, they yeah. got a six and a half game lead. Speak uh, Jim Barnett to be a coach. You know, it was good listening to him last oh, yeah, night. You know, the coaching toward the end. You yeah. know, okay, foul him. But then, yeah. Foul him. Foul him. Come on. And yeah. that last, Rich, the last five minutes of that Laker game last night took about twenty minutes. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Just ridiculous. Yeah. Well, they keep the fouling. And keep, they kept fouling, and fou everybody was fouling. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it made sense, though. Well, yeah, no, I did. But I just yeah. was like, come on, guys, play play basketball. <laughs> get that, uh, that last little bit seconds of the clock, though. Get that last little bit of prop right there. Okay. All right, here we go. 
Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we cut to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question about baseball players and presidents. Sharing the name of a U.S. president, this catcher played for the Cardinals, Padres, Orioles, and Giants. He retired in 1991 after making two World Series appearances. Who is he? And we, the hint was, I didn't give the hint because you guys didn't yeah. see it. He was the 35th president. Yeah, and then Rich, uh, go ahead with your answer, Rich. Well, we I believe it's Terry Kennedy. It is Terry yeah, it Kennedy. Is. It is. Terry, Terry Kennedy. Good guy. Very very good talker. He was one of those guys that Rich and I would love to talk to after games because he would always have something interesting to say. And he was always agreeable. We love those kind of guys, don't we, Rich? <laughs> no, I, I like the, the more irrational ones. I like to see how Chris handles the world stars in the world. And uh, Vladimir Putin is awesome. That was more fun. Uh, you know, Will, Will Clark was always fun to deal with because he was sometimes just upbraid you for whatever reason and embarrass you in front of everybody, but it was always in good fun. And, and Whitey Herzog, one time, I saw him knock a, a, a reporter's um, little handheld uh, microphone out of his hand and tell him to go, you know, you know what yourself. One time I was, I was on the field with him before a Giants game at Candlestick, and I asked him, I said, what, Whitey, what do you think of Candlestick? He looked up and looked around him and he goes, geez, I feel like I turned a toilet bowl. <laughs> That's Whitey. Yeah. That, that, that guy that was smacked to have a uh, microphone almost snapped smack out of his hand might have been me one time. Oh. When the Giants beat the Cardinals in 19 to 6 in the game, I was in his uh, office and asked a question. He turned around and he get that thing out of my face. Yeah, he hated. Rat, uh, he had he hated microphones, hated radio people, hated TV people. He just hated hated everybody. Except for the players. Good. I'm not, I didn't have to take it personally. No, you can't take it personally. Maybe he just wanted to write in his answers instead of you know speaking to the right. microphone. Um, so, Rich, uh, what do you think about the, the draft this year? Anything exciting going on? <laughs> well, the four is better make hay because <laughs> yeah. they've oh, got okay. a lot of key people. Uh, you know, two potential starting quarterbacks, two are or starting inside linebackers. Yeah, Rich, tell us about the, Go over briefly all the players that they have lost because it's kind of startling the number of defections, free agency, retirement, and also their head coach is gone. And where, where does it all be? Start with, with Harbaugh. That's the first big loss. Well, you know, that, that, that's kind of uh, a very perplexing storyline. You know, first it was a mutual departure, then it was Jim left because he no longer was wanted by the organization. You know, there, there are things that are left unsaid and, and uh, untold, but I think the bottom line was there was a, certainly a clash of will and philosophy and maybe personality between York, Falky, and Harbaugh that was insurmountable to the point that they probably wanted him to make some changes he wasn't willing to make, and uh, you know, when it all comes down to it, Jim Harbaugh works at the behest of, of ownership, and Maybe his hubris and uh, a very strong-minded owner just couldn't come to an understanding. What would have happened though, if Rich? What would have happened though if the Niners had been in the playoffs and say gone to the Super Bowl? How would they have justified firing this guy? They would have really looked bad. Well, they were far from that, so it's kind of a that's a moot point, I guess. But I mean, it would have, it would have been interesting. Had, though. had things yeah. gone better last year, I don't think we would have seen the risk. Mm. Just a large chasm. But I think there was pressure from management to, to make some changes that either Jim was unwilling or, uh, you know, loath to do. And I think that was a big sticking point. You know, you hear also about him taking down memorabilia from the five Super Bowl championship teams and maybe wanting things done a certain way or maybe not wanting to make changes in the organization staff wise and not maximizing the potential of Colin Kaepernick, either in philosophy or in gamesmanship. It's all added up to a fortunate turn of events where they go from, you know, a great team to an also ran team, and they essentially ran him out of town because he wouldn't, by all accounts, get the accommodations that management and ownership wanted. Now, Rich Walkoff from KGO Radio in San Francisco is joining us to talk a little uh, NFL football. We were talking about Chris Borland having to uh, make the tough decision to retire because he's worried about uh, having some concussion problems that could lead to uh, you know, more physical uh, deterioration later in life. Of course, Patrick Willis, all-pro linebacker, playing all-pro, retired last week. They lost Mike Iopati, who was an all-pro uh, offensive lineman. Parrish Cox signed a, 
a deal elsewhere, I believe, with Tennessee, and then a couple of wide receivers left. I mean, this 49er team is going to be a much different-looking team next year, Rich. Yeah, yeah, and it's Chris Tolliver who went to uh, the Washington Redskins, brought in by Scott McLuhan, who was the 49er, uh, you know, personnel guy when Tolliver arrived here in the Bay Area five years ago. And, you know, with uh, Tremaine Brock missing most of 2014, you had Cox and Tolliver in starting corners. You had Willis and Borland, who were tag team starting inside linebackers. Mike Cupani was a starting guard. Crabtree starting wide out. So you lose five starters or six starters right there. And we, yeah, we didn't mention Frank Gore, too. Yeah. And, of course, yeah, gosh, of course, Frank Gore is the, the franchise leader is, is the rusher and the guy who rushed for 301 yards the last two games of the regular season. Mm. But here's the good news. Cupani uh, came off a terrible ankle injury in the NFC Championship game in uh, a year ago was not the same player this past year. So his run blocking was strong, but his movement was not. His pass blocking was, a, was really a liability. Brandon Thomas coming off an AC Mattel injury in 2013 and a third round pick uh, in 2014 with potential to start at six guard. So that may be an upgrade in terms of mobility and pulling and the like. Frank Gore, I think most 49 fans would love to have him back. He turned 32 in May and he guaranteed him two years like Indianapolis did. That was a hard thing for the 49ers to do. And, you know, Carlos Hyde, if he leans down, which I think is imperative, he played at 235 last year, and that's pullback size for a tailback body. Uh, I think I think he could be an every down back. You have Reggie Bush, Daniel Hunter. I think they'll tag team those guys, and that will be serviceable. But they will certainly miss Frank Gore's grit, leadership, and the blitz pickup ability. And, uh, you know, the quarterbacks, they bring in Sharice Wright. The uh, guy was the number two pick of the Chargers a couple of years ago, and decent player, but not in color versus stature. And then you've got to hope that uh, Dante Johnson, last year's rookie surprise, was strong. Jimmy Ward slot in the corner. And uh, Chris Cook, I'm not exactly as, as enamored with as a, as a player. They're going to be looking, I think, in the draft for some healthy quarterback. And, of course, the linebacker, where Willis and Borland are not there, you get Navarro Bowman back. Certainly a huge, a huge plus. That defense is going to be missing, uh, you know, co captain Willis and the young rookie stud Borland. I love the idea of them bringing in Torrey Smith. I think that's a, an upgrade uh, with uh, wide receivers. Not only a model, no, no not only a model, yeah, exactly. And Jerome Simpson yeah. may have some off the field issues in the past, and hopefully he has uh, put in the rear view mirror and matured and, uh, and, and worked through those. But you're talking about two big play, large targets receivers, something the 49ers really didn't have after Red and Moss and uh, Ted Ginn Jr. the last few years. So you throw in uh, Bruce Ellington and, and Quint Patton and Ron Bolden, you've got five really quality wide receivers for Kaepernick who I would hope in evolution of, as, as, a, as, a, as a growing young NFL quarterback will start to turn the corner and learning how to read defense and make better decisions throwing the football. I just spent the last three months at Texas and O's performance enhancement clinic with Kurt Warner and other quarterback coaches to learn about blitz pickup, how to read defenses, chaos drills where they go seven on seven and simulate those quick decisions that you have to make. And, you know, that'll be a, it's a huge question mark because Kaepernick in, in, in this uh, quarterback driven league, he, he evolves with these better weapons catapult the four hitters back into the playoffs. And if he does not, you're looking at a you know an also ran team that will be at a crossroads a year from now on his future as a team. What about our uh, friends at the other side of the bay, the Raiders? Anything going on specific that you want to talk about them? Well hey look, they've got sixty million in uh, salary cap space, so Reggie McKenzie is going shopping like Paris Hilton on a drunken <laughs> scooper, right? I mean, <laughs> Respectable moves last year, I think, bringing in a lot of uh, old war horses to hopefully lead the charge and, and turn that, uh, turn around a once proud franchise. I think only mixed results with the veterans, but you know, Derek Carr and Khalil Mack were tremendous acquisitions in the draft or, or, or drafting, and now you can build around them. I mean, uh, 
you know, they didn't get to walk over in, but with Davis Murray with a better offensive line and this guy, Lee Hudson, as the center, will anchor a very promising offensive line. And if Latavius can stay healthy, that will give them a running game to car. It's time to do his thing. And certainly uh, they will be looking for a big play receiver in the, in the draft and picking number four, and they could get an Amari Cooper or you know, Kevin White or you know, almost their picking of, of the litter at that, at that position. And they're, they're a team on the rise. I mean, I, I know they're in one of the tougher divisions in football, but I think they, they have a shot to be a 500 team or better a good draft. All right. Great. We are in on, on the phone with uh, Rich Rolkoff of uh, KGO Radio. We're going to cut to our second commercial break. Here's a trivia question. Again, the theme is baseball players and presidents. From 1983 to 1999, this outfielder played for 10 teams in his 17th season. He wore the uniforms of the Yankees, Indians, Expos, Braves, Red Sox, Rangers, Blue Jays, Dodgers, and Twins. It isn't that nobody wanted him. They did as he was a very consistent player. He just never led the league in anything. He did go to two World Series, but lost them both. Who is this uh, that shared the name, uh, last name with a president, all right? Mm -hmm. Stay with us. You're listening to Sports Econ 101. We will be right back. Is it Carter? I'm trying to think of who that would be. Carter. Carter? Oh, Gary Carter. Yeah, 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 yeah. it would be Gary Carter. No, I was no. thinking the, the black guy in the Blue Jays. Yeah. Uh, oh, Joe Carter. Now, Joe Carter won a World Series though with the Blue Jays. Remember, he hit the game-winning homer? Yeah. I hit it with, uh, yeah, against uh, Philadelphia. I'll mention one of them. Oh, yeah, the Braves. Braves. So who would it be? It wouldn't be, do we have any guys named Ford? No. Reagan? No. Clinton? No. Bush? No. I keep going backwards. Uh, let's <laughs> wait, wait, okay, start Nixon? With, get Washington? Oh, we have to go all the way back. No, yeah, we have to go. <laughs> are, we, are we more recent? Can you give a hint? Is it, is it more recent? How long are we going, guys? Uh, we can do just just one more segment of 13 minutes. Okay. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate yeah. you coming on with us. Um, I'm trying to think. Who would it be? Let's see. Lincoln. Johnson. Harrison. <laughs> Cliff Johnson. There you go. Harrison. Grant. McKinley. Roosevelt. Uh, Wilson. <laughs> Uh, Harding, no. Coolidge. Yeah, well, that's pretty good. Uh, let's see. Uh, You're an educated man. Um, I don't think there are any Eisenhower. Truman. Eisenhower. Are there any Trumans? Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. Uh, I can't think of it. Polk. Polk. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> Fillmore. Pierce. Van Buren. Van Buren. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I, I think, can't think of it. Here we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm sorry, I'm laughing here. Uh, Edward Brown and Bruce McGowan uh, are the hosts of the show here. We are at our second trivia question, and here it is. From 1983 to 1999, this outfielder played for 10 teams in his 17 seasons. He wore the uniforms of the Yankees, Indians, Expos, Braves, Red Sox, Rangers, Blue Jays, Dodgers, and Twins. It isn't that nobody wanted him. They did. He was just he was a very consistent player. He just never led the league in anything. Mm. He did go to two World Series, but lost them both. Who is this uh, that shared the name of uh, the U.S. president? I have no, I, I'm stumped. How about you, Rich? Any idea? Well, I guess wrong, and uh, Joe Carter didn't want a chance. That's right. Who we got? It's an Otis, I notice. Otis Nixon. Otis Nixon. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Otis Nixon. Yeah, he played a long Nixon's time. One. Nixon's the one. Nixon's the one, yes. yes. I am not a crook. I am not a crook. Very good. He didn't actually say that. He said, I want this country to know that their president's not a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. He said it that way. Oh, that's how he said it. Yeah. Okay. And you know what? When he did the uh, peace sign, it's, right. he did it. It's victory. Victory. He that's right. Well, it's, the, it's, the Winston, it's right. The Winston Churchill uh, victory sign. Be for victory. That's right. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So, um, uh, Rich, uh, you want to talk about spring training at all? Anything no, exciting on that? Whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the Giants because they're in the odd year and I know what happens in the odd year. Yeah. <laughs> it's a strange uh, phenomenon with the Giants. Isn't it rich? They win a World Series, then they don't go to the playoffs, and they win another World Series. Well, Posey got hurt in 11. Yeah, and then they don't go to the playoffs in 13, and then they win it all. So what's going to happen this year? I mean, they didn't. They actually lost some talent this year, and, uh, you know, it's going to be tough for them to repeat. No, no Sandoval, uh, no Michael Morse. Uh, now no Hunter Pence for the first month of the season. That's going to be a well, interesting year. You know, here's another thing. They've never repeated, okay? I That's mean, right. Me, don't talk to me about dynasty until you do that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
you know, there's, there's all the value about the dynasty and championship blood is a new book out for the Giants. And I understand heralding this great run. It is amazing. But it is not a dynasty by my definition, or I think most people's definition. If you don't defend your crown, how can you call it a dynasty? Yeah, there hasn't been a dynasty in the National League since the, uh, wow, since I think the St. Louis Cardinals, uh, and that's been a long time ago. But, yeah, and it's interesting, too, because you look at the, the, the cast of characters, the only guys that really have been a huge part of both championships, uh, the only guy in the, in the starting, everyday starting eight has been Buster Posey. I mean, they're a completely different group of guys every year. By the way, you think of the, the, the gas house game? Madison Bumgarner, a rookie in 2010. He was, and he, he did pitch well, but he wasn't a big part of their championship in 2010. And then, of well, course, he was a respectable part. He was a respectable part. But then Matt Cain was a big part of it in 2010, but not so much this year. Tim Lincecum, not so much in 2012, but a big part of it in 2010. So a lot of different people. Brian Wilson was involved. Yeah, now, no longer. Sergio Romo didn't have a big hand in it, yeah. as big as he did two years ago. So it's just, it's interesting how they, you know, they think, think about it. 2010, they had guys like Pat Burrell and Cody Ross right. and, and Andres Torres and Freddie Sanchez and Edgar Renteria, and they're all, you know, they all moved on. Juan Ribe, and then they brought in a whole new cast of guys, Marco Scudero, and so on and so forth. And it just amazes me how they keep winning with all these new faces. And I'm actually well, glad. I guess we could say the only common thread beyond uh, Bochy and Sapien would be Buster Posey. Yeah, right Buster now. Posey, yeah. And let's go. Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm actually glad. He has been the key guy, I would think, in all three championship runs. No question. Yeah. No question. I'm actually glad that they got rid of uh, Panda. Just. I, I, I've mentioned this before that he reminds me a little bit too much of like a Ryan Howard or a Prince Fielder, where you know they just the, the weight just doesn't seem to, to fit them well. And I know he does very well in the postseason, but I, I just I think it's catching up to him. Well, what, what bothers me, and I know how you feel about this, Rich. What bothers me was is when I heard him make these disparaging remarks oh, yeah. about Brian Sabian. When Sabian bent over backwards to accommodate this guy, he says, "Oh, he disrespected my agent." Come on. Give me a break. And then the that Pablo was alluding to was the initial offer yeah. early in 2014, which was perceived by Pablo's people as disrespectfully low, but it's an opening gambit in negotiations. It's just that. I mean, he took it personally as though he wasn't worthy of Penn's money. Then he has the World Series to put the exclamation point on it, and he's offered Hunter Penn's money, which suddenly isn't good enough because... Austin offers more, but a couple of things come to light afterwards. First of all, his remarks saying the only guys that miss are Bochy and Tank, pretty outrageous. And then Aubrey Huff on yeah. Facebook posts a comment that, you know, nobody was backing Pablo because he didn't want to work out and lose the weight. The team wanted him to get on the treadmill every day, and he was, you know, blocking and, and fucking at that. And it was all about, you know, the panda in, in the eyes of Huff. Sounds pretty plausible. It's unfortunate, but I, I I thought he would go when when he was facing this crossroads of comparable offers from Boston and the Giants because he's a guy with a voracious appetite on and off the field, and I think he wanted to take a bite out of something new and, and explore a, a horizon that had a what he thought was a big upside. Been there, done that with the Giants, and be careful what you wish for. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, the equity of the goodwill yeah. doesn't travel, you know? And the, the Red Sox Nation may be among the most passionate, but they're also the most critical. Like oh, the nations, yeah. yeah. Uh, very unforgiving. And the thing is, I think it might work out, though, for, for Sandoval because uh, they can use him as a DH once in a while. I mean, he, he's a terrific third baseman, but he's also injury prone at his age with a lot of mileage on him, and maybe he will turn into a DH once the big poppy retires. Yeah, I'll be watching that with a thought in the American League, but, you know, when you're 28, 29 years old and you're carrying 30, 40, 50 pounds above what you should be, it's going to compromise everything you do and, and it increase the likelihood of injury. So it, it's a calculated risk by Boston to just throw them all that money. But with Ortiz and Ramirez and, uh, you know, a strong Latin uh, connection going there, perhaps that was part of the allure. And, you know, Fenway's inviting on, on a whole lot of levels and the passion of the Boston fans. It's really interesting that when, when Pablo leaves, he makes reference to only the few people he'll miss, being the manager who he claims is like a father figure, and Hunter Pence, who has been, uh, you know, just uh, unbelievably uh, compelling figure. 
but you have a dozen Latin players on the Giants, maybe the most of them well in the league, and he doesn't make reference to a single one of his, of his brethren there as huh. people he would pick. I find that very startling and in some ways disconcerting. Yeah, you, no, no you question. You think of what, what that means. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, they get so much money, but I don't think they think long term from the standpoint of how they're going to be perceived. You know, it's it's uh, it's one thing to say, like you said, you know, okay, I've done a lot of things with the Giants, and I, I want to move on to greener, or, or not greener, but just different pastures and see what I can do there. I mean, that's a fair assessment, but don't be disparaging because that stuff that follows you for a long time. Well, you know, you can't have uh, kind of losing vision and perspective. And, Twenty six, seven, eight years old when you're in the middle of the game as you would as an outsider or as a man uh, 10, 20 years retired. So I'll cut him some slack on that. That's where your entourage, your, your confidants and your agents and your parents and you know, friends and uncles and whomever would be there to perhaps provide that kind of experience and insight that uh, you, you would be missing. And maybe, look, who's to say what what value system is for Pablo Sandoval? Uh, I mean, Money is enormous either way, and maybe he just wanted a new challenge, a new uh, role, a new yeah. agenda, and maybe he didn't feel as at home with the Giants as much as the fans loved him. Maybe it wasn't as mutual in terms of uh, behind the scenes of the clubhouse, and maybe in a way he was forced out because of uh, the aforementioned references. So, yeah. hey, you know, go for it. You, you know, he's got a skill set that doesn't translate every day, but on the, you turn the calendar in October, and uh, he's, he's with modern-day Reggie Jackson, right? <laughs> Well, a wise man once told me, everything that you say should be true, but not everything that's true should be said. Uh -huh. Good yeah. point. Hey, Rich, i got to ask you about the Warriors. I mean, here in the Bay Area, we have really one of the most compelling stories, I think, in all of sports with a team that just a few years ago was a joke of a franchise. They've sold out every game for the last 120-some-odd games. They have arguably two of the most exciting uh, performers in, in Clay Thompson and Steph Curry, a team of just hardworking, gritty, uh, overachievers, I guess you could call them, and guys that are one for all and all for one. It's a great story. Can this team win it all this year? I'm sorry, a great story. And then what, please? Well, I was going to say, do you believe that this team can win it all this year? Obviously, they have the best record, but does that translate into success in the postseason? Well, that's the great caveat. I mean, this has been a storybook ride, but it doesn't necessarily have a storybook ending. And we all know that come playoff time, the game changes, and uh, the variables are a whole, whole other story. They don't, they are not a playoff tested and truly tested team. You know, they've had a modicum of success, but nothing special. You've got to stay healthy, you got to play a half-court game, and you got to do it night after night. It means they haven't proven successful at in the past. Uh, Know, in terms of this, this organization, this team, and, and the, the personnel that they have. Could they do it? Yeah. I mean, they've got the depth, and they've got the explosion, and they've got tenacity, and they've got teamwork, and all that. But Andrew Bogan has been very fragile in terms of staying healthy. Half court game against a team like Memphis would not be a great matchup. The West is so strong that a, a Memphis or OKC or other big teams certainly give them all they can handle, and for San Antonio, it's conceivable they could be a first or a second round victim and win 60 games and be the most celebrated team in the league. So, you know, until they can get over that hurdle, uh, it's more of a hope and a wish or a dream, that, not a dream, but it's more of a hope and a wish than an expectation. I, I, it could very well happen, but I, I couldn't sit here and tell you that they're going to be able to stand up to the rigors of, uh, you know, multiple long series against strong, talented, deep state teams in the NBA West. Well, I think the best thing for the Warriors is that this is a, a league right now that really doesn't have that dominant team that has the look of a, of a sure champion. And, and therefore, you know, Steve Kerr, to me, that's a great story, too. Yeah. A rookie coach who just stepped in for Mark Jackson was very popular and done a terrific job of seamlessly taking over and really taking this group and, and getting even more out of them than Mark Jackson got. Well, here's the deal. I, I think Mark Jackson did a good job, but I wouldn't call it terrific in the sense that, uh, you know, the development of Harrison Barnes, the injury to Andrew, the, or the, the leg problems of Andrew Iguodala, playing David Lee more minutes. I mean, look at the changes that we've seen that Kerr made 
not only defensively, but personnel-wise, in terms of the minutes used and, and whatnot. And I think the Warriors are, are passing the ball 15 to 20 more times per ball game under mm-hmm. Kerr than they did under Jackson. The ball movement, defense, how he's using his rotation, I think clearly superior, not to mention all of the behind-the-scenes issues that seem to be bubbling under the surface that undermine Jackson's tenure with the organization. So, yeah, I'll give him his props for taking a team to a 50-win season, but they were bounced in the first round minus Bogut against the Clippers, and, you know, heaven help them if they uh, don't have Bogut this time around. I mean, I, I know that JaVale McGee is still out there and Jermaine O'Neal, and uh, both guys would be welcome to, uh, welcome additions to the Warriors because Memphis and Dealey is too raw. Bogut is too much a question mark. And if, if you lose Bogut, honestly say this Warriors team is going to be a favorite to win at all. I would, I would think most people would say no. If he stays healthy and it's something he's not, not able to do for the majority of his career, yeah, the Warriors have as good a chance or, as any, and maybe they'd be, uh, they'd be the favorites to win at all. So that's a big caveat. Okay, Rich. Rich, thank you, thank you so much <clears throat> Excuse me for joining us. Yeah, the uh, Warriors definitely uh, playing a lot of selfless ball. Uh, we've been uh, on the phone with Rich Walkoff of KGO Radio. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, guys. It's been a pleasure. Right. Keep up the good work. All right. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go to our third and final commercial break here. After 18 years after this U.S. president left office, this future Hall of Famer was born. He played his entire career for one team, won one ser- World Series title. He was also... Uh, he also won two MVP awards and three triple crowns. Ooh. Who is this player? All right, stay with us. Sports Econ 101 will have some closing comments. Three triple crowns. And he's from a, let's see, and he was born 18 years after the president left office. Left office. Hack Wilson? No. It would be Hack Wilson. (coughs) I'll give you ones that you think about. Coolant Carter. Roosevelt. Kennedy. This one's got me stuck. Obama. 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 Hey, I remember that guy. Yeah, that guy played third base. Obama. James Obama. James Obama. Okay. Ready? Yeah. There we go. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for the show, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. When we cut to the third and final commercial break about, uh, let's see, a trivia theme is baseball players and presidents, we asked this question. 18 years after this U.S. president left office, this future Hall of Famer was born. He played his entire career for one team and won one, ser- one, one World Series title. He also won two MVP awards and three Triple Crowns. Mm. Who is this player? I should know this, but I, I, I'm stunned. Okay, so here's a hint. He was a pitcher. Right. And uh, 18 years after the 17th U.S. president left office. Okay, so that would have been Johnson. That's right. Walter and Johnson. Walter Johnson, yeah. Walter Johnson. That's right. You know, and he won his only World Series when he was, I think, in his 40s. And 1925 Pirates, right? No, it was actually the 1924 Washington oh, what Senators. I oh, I'm, th- <laughs> I'm thinking of Honus Wagner. Honus Wagner, that's yeah, right. Yeah, that's no, right. it's an interesting that's right. story about Walter Johnson. Uh, he beat the New York Giants, who had won two of the previous three World Series. They'd been three World Series in a row, and they were actually winning Game 7 in Washington, and in the ninth inning, with the Giants one inning away from winning the World Series, a ground ball was hit to a shortstop by the name of Freddie Lindstrom, and hit a pebble, bounced over his head, and the tying run scored, and then they later won the game in extra innings. So, uh, and, 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 the, and the story was that President uh, Coolidge, Calvin Coolidge, was at the game with his wife, Grace, and they did the Charleston and topped the dugout, in celebration. <laughs> That's the story. It doesn't sound like Calvin Coolidge. Uh, he was no, kind of a taciturn like, New Englander. Yeah. You know, taciturn New Englander. They yeah. said Calvin Coolidge uh, looked like he'd been weaned on a pickle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing it wasn't taft up there. Yeah, okay, yeah. here's our thoughts for the day. Uh, I realized that if I was going to achieve anything in life, I had to be aggressive. I had to get out there and go for it. 
I know fear is an obstacle for some people, but it's an illusion to me. Who said that? God, you got me. Michael Jordan said that. Oh, I like that. Okay. Very good. And ain't no man can avoid being born average. Ain't the ain't there? Let's see. But there ain't no man got to be common. Will Rogers. <laughs> Satchel Page. Satchel Page. That sounds like Satchel, Satchel, Satchel Page. Page. Yeah. Okay, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective and giving away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. At the Lighthouse. That's right. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. So long. What is this? Thing, by the way?